Well, good morning, Walden Church. Last week, we were in Acts chapter 4, but down at the bottom, there's one more paragraph that we didn't read. It said, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Do you ever read those verses and think to yourself, what would make someone do something like that? People just sharing their goods. There's no needy among them, it says, which means people took care of each other. And that's because the Bible says that the church is a family. 1 Peter 3 says you should be like one big happy family, full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. Would you let your brother starve? Would you let your mother freeze? No. And then at the bottom, we have one person singled out. One person doing this act, right? Barnabas. He goes and sells a field that he had. It was probably a family inheritance. And he then gives all the money to the church. He didn't do it in secret right? Because Luke records it. People knew that it happened, and it's a beautiful testimony of love and faith. Well done, Barnabas. But then if you turn the page and go to Acts chapter 5, this new chapter starts with a single word. But that's not good. Verse 1 says, But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. The story of Ananias and Sapphira was placed back to back with this story of Barnabas. It's a contrast between the two. Ananias was a pretty common name back then. The name Sapphira probably comes from the sapphire stone. Ananias means God is gracious, and Sapphira means beautiful. So what's going on? Well, the church is brand new. It's young. We haven't had thousands of years of church history to tell us how things should go. Heck, they don't even have a printed Bible yet. So probably in these early stages, a sort of contest evolves and everyone is super eager to lay some sort of contribution down at the apostles' feet. For whatever reason, more likely greed or fear, Ananias and Sapphira don't give all the profit to the church. They keep back some for themselves, which of course they had every right to do. But... The Greek word here for kept back is also sometimes translated as to rob in the Bible. So regardless of the amount of money Ananias and Sapphira keep, could have been large, could have been small, the Bible says they're robbing God because they said they were giving all of it, but they weren't. So again, Keeping some back for themselves wasn't bad. Rather, it was the fact that they made a show of giving it all, just like Barnabas. Why did they do that? They were thinking of the impression that they would make when they laid that money down at the apostles' feet, but they were not thinking of the fact that they were also lying to God. They were thinking of the praise they would gain, When everybody at the church saw them giving the money, but not realizing that God saw them too. 
Now, I'm Generation X, right? So I grew up in the 80s, and we had a word for people like that. They were called posers. <laughs> it's a person who acts or imitates others in a certain way just so that they can be seen. Because it's so obvious, they're imitating Barnabas. They saw that he got a certain amount of public recognition and they wanted to feel that same way. They, they said, oh, that must feel nice. I would like that same recognition too. They want to be thought of as generous. They want to be thought of as holy. Good thing people don't act like that today. We've come a long way, haven't we? <laughs> no, of course, it's still around today. Is pride still around today? Of course. Is hypocrisy still around today? Absolutely. The Cambridge Dictionary defines hypocrisy as a situation in which someone pretends to believe something that they do not really believe or that is the opposite of what they do or say at another time. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a hypocrite as a person who puts on a false appearance of virtue or religion or a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. Ananias and Sapphira are hypocrites. Well, we did say it's human nature, right? So, I mean, is that really such a bad thing? Well, would it surprise you that whenever they do a survey about why some Christians leave a church or, or why some outsiders won't go to church or take church seriously, hypocrites is always in the top five. Yeah, it's a bad thing. Such a bad thing that it has been with us since the very beginning. Look at verse three. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? How did Peter know? Last week, we said the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. So God told him. Peter could just feel it. God gave him divine knowledge. Ananias, however, is not filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter says he is filled with Satan. Ananias means God is gracious, but God is also holy, which means God can only be right. God cannot be associated with sin. Sapphira means beautiful but her heart is ugly. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men found, came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. I know some people who don't think that a loving God would just kill two people because they lied, right? About a business transaction and, and about their tithe. I can see how someone would be hostile to this story and they would say, see, this is another example of a mean, angry God. It doesn't seem like the punishment fits the crime. But this isn't the first time that it happened. In Leviticus 10, it says, now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. These two tried to give God an offering that he didn't ask for. They were trying to impress God 
but God wasn't impressed. And he killed them. Joshua 7, it says, Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them, and see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Achan took the treasures that he found during battle. The problem was he was commanded not to. And after he confessed, the soldiers killed him for his crime. And so when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did, it reminds us that these Old Testament stories are there to show us not only what is right and what is wrong, but how seriously God judges sin. Listen, how can I be grateful for the cross if I don't first recognize the seriousness of sin. Because darkness will always try to get a foothold in Christ's church. Darkness will try to get inside and go to work. Right now, our youth group upstairs, they are studying the armor of God. Why is a suit of armor used as a symbol for your Christian walk? Because it's not an offensive weapon, it's a defensive weapon. Our faith protects us from darkness. The Holy Spirit fills us so that we are not filled with the world. I mean, yes, at the end of the day, it was just a lie. It was just a lie. But in these early stages of the church, while the church is still in its infancy, God is not going to allow even the slightest amount of hypocrisy or even the smallest amount of pride or deception. Yes, everyone looked at the example of Barnabas, and now look at the example of Ananias and Sapphira. They were made an example of as well. We're trying to do something beautiful and original here in God's church. God's church has never been done before. This new church of Jesus, it's going to be pure, it's going to be light. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ. And you need to picture a bride standing at the back of the sanctuary, dressed in white with a bouquet of flowers, arm in arm with her father, untouched, unblemished, perfect, not a spot on that dress, not a hair out of place. Ephesians 5 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that she might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. God loves his church, and he is jealous for it. So as members of the church, as members of a family, it's our responsibility to project his church as beautiful. We need to put his church on display as beautiful. Now, no doubt the church was praising God for the generous offering that Barnabas had brought. But at the same time, darkness was whispering to this couple, hey, that could be you. You could be the next Barnabas. It wasn't just that they lied. You're right. If it's just a lie, the punishment is heavy-handed. But it's more than that. Proverbs 8 says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. The Hebrews knew this verse. They knew pride was a sin. They knew God hated it. They knew God valued humility. Even Jesus teaches Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. The religious leaders of the day, that's how they worshipped. They called attention to their gifts so that everybody could see them and give them praise. 
Hey everybody, look at this great thing I'm doing. Look at this good deed I'm doing. But as Jesus launches his church, he makes it clear. We are not going to be like that. Okay, but pride. Is pride really that bad? It can be. When it's rooted in selfishness. Remember, this is a church that was thriving because they were looking out for everyone else. This was a group of people who considered every other person family. So the reputation isn't, hey everybody, look how good I am, but rather, none of us lacks anything. But selfishness, if it were to enter into this community, someone who is more concerned with reputation rather than love, if something like that takes a foothold, then it just becomes a gateway drug to every other sin. What a dark shadow this couple was about to cast on a newborn church. What did they do? They cast upon it the shadow of hypocrisy. And then verse 11 says, And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. We must bear in mind that this was darkness's first attempt to obtain a footing among believers in a brand new church. And it was absolutely necessary that such an attempt be dealt with immediately and severely. And God did that by causing the death of Ananias and Sapphira. So, when asked the question, why don't more people go to church? People say, because church is full of hypocrites. They say, Christians have this holier-than-thou attitude. Is that the image that we want our neighbors to have about us? No, I want my neighbor to have a genuine relationship with me and a genuine relationship with Jesus. We don't want to drive people away from the house of God. We want them to come in and feel accepted, to feel loved, to feel appreciated. We want them to know that this is the one place where they can experience God with, and, and fellowship with his family. We should be a true reflection of who God is. Even a church full of hypocrites can make a good first impression, but it's the lasting impression of sincerity that has the deepest mark. And that's where we need to focus our attention. If we want to grow as a church body with God's blessing, then we need to be a place where people feel genuinely accepted and loved. And the only way they're going to feel genuinely accepted and loved is if we genuinely accept them and love them. That means we need to get rid of all the appearance of anything that might drive people away, especially hypocrisy. How do you do that? Well, we could try developing a couple of traits. And the first one is transparency. In other words, no posers. We need to tear down the walls and be real with each other. Why do people put walls up in the first place? Because they want to appear to be something that they are not. We do it because we have something to hide. Hypocrisy has a lot to hide, so walls go up. If you've ever done a back lot tour at a TV studio, uh, you'll see some of the stuff that lets you know that most of what is on TV is fake. <laughs> There's nothing behind the plaster. There's no substance. That room only has three sides. Behind those walls, it's just unfinished board and studio light. There's nothing in those cupboards. They're made to look real. It's made to deceive you. It's made to look like the real thing, but it's not. Half the time, the news anchors, they're dressed with a jacket and tie, but they're wearing jogging shorts underneath the desk. And you'd never know it because you can't see it. They have you fooled. You imagine that it's all there. So it must be there. They count on the fact that you'll imagine it's real. Too many Christians are counting on the fact that you'll imagine they have it all together if they just put up a good image. But they're not all there. Listen, God needs his people 
to be transparent. When the blood of Jesus washes away your dirt and filth, you should have nothing to hide. Today we call this imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is when you doubt your own skill and success. You feel you're not talented. You're not worthy as others believe, and you're scared that one day people will realize that you're a fraud. You think pastors feel this? Of course. I look at other pastors and I see their successes or popularity, and I think they have it all together and I don't. I bet they learned how to stop sinning. I bet they don't yell at their kids. I bet they don't struggle with temptation. So what's wrong with me? I must be broken. I don't deserve to be a, a what? But the easy way to silence that voice is to be transparent, to be honest, to be genuine. What if Ananias and Sapphira had said, hey guys, we sold this property, but we're struggling too. So we can't afford to give everything right now, but we prayed about it, and this is the portion that we can give. Just be honest. The outside world doesn't need to think that we're perfect. Just honest. Not people who have it all together, just genuine. And second, I would say we need to be more aware. Have you noticed that there's a lot of social walls built up? People are generally happy with their little world. It's hard to get any stranger to say hello or to smile or wave back at you. People are reluctant to let anyone in to their world. Philippians 2 says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news from you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Even in the early church, right? Even in the early church, people who looked out for the interests of others were rare. People who looked out for the interests of others more than their own are rare. But for the church to survive, we need to be aware. We need to be empathetic to the people around us. For the Bible to say that in that first church, there was not a needy person among them, that implies that we know each other's stories, that we are aware of those around us. We gotta know what their needs are before we can meet their needs. How can I assure my neighbors that Jesus will meet their needs if I don't even know what their needs are? This is why we are a neighborhood community church. Our first concern is to be a neighbor, to be a member of this community, to help and to pour into this community. I'm so glad our church is not located on a highway because I don't know how to serve a highway. The Roman poet Horace said, your own safety is at stake when your neighbor's wall is ablaze. You know what that means? It means what affects one affects us all. The former executive director of Code for America, Jennifer Polka, she says, when one neighbor helps another, we strengthen our communities. That's what the church should be known for. Not hypocrisy, but strengthening our communities. And third, perseverance. Now this one's tough. Perseverance is hard, especially when you don't see any progress. You know, it's, it's hard to keep going when you don't see yourself making any headway. I have been fixing one sprinkler head <laughs> for a few weeks. <laughs> you heard me, one. Every stage took time. I am not handy with tools, but I'm trying. But it still needs to get fixed. And right now, the spray is too far and I need to bring it back in. I have the tool, but I can't get the tool to thread. So I'm taking a mental break because these things frustrate me, but I'm not giving up. My younger brother is not a Christian. And I've been sharing my faith with him for our entire lives together. And he's no closer to Jesus now than he was when we were in high school. 
but I've got to persevere. Some of your neighbors and family members are probably giving you an ulcer. <laughs> you have a love-hate relationship with them because they won't get their life straight and they're not getting the big picture of what life is all about. And you're frustrated because you're offering them something and they're rejecting it. They're rejecting that one thing that could possibly save them. Maybe they're even running in the other direction. Persevere. Don't give up loving them because they haven't come along in the time frame that you've given them. Our neighbors need us to be consistent in caring and perseverant with the gospel, especially to that neighbor that thinks that all Christians are hypocrites. Jesus never gave up on me, so I can't give up on them. And I'll close with this. If the church is going to succeed in its mission, it needs to realize two things. The first of which is, well, that I already mentioned, is that our mission is for people. Never buildings. Those marvelous structures that house our worship services, alone, they are not capable of sharing the good news. The task to love the world gets done by human hands. And that brings us to the second thing. The church is a community of faith. That being the case, it's important for this community to set aside its differences and to concentrate on becoming the one single body of Christ. That means we have to push back on all those labels. Fundamentalist, liberal, conservative, Protestant, Catholic. We need to go back to being just Christians. Ephesians 2 says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So, making peace. And might reconcile us before, both to God, in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's a pretty good blueprint for the church. Tear down walls, make peace, not strangers, but citizens, built on a foundation of the Bible with Christ as the cornerstone. Let's pray. Lord, your church is beautiful. And we pray that she would stay beautiful for the remainder of her days. Continue to strengthen her, empower her, equip her, and keep her pure. Allow her to be a source of light and a source of love, a source of hope, a place of grace, and a place of forgiveness, a place of welcoming and acceptance, and at the same time, a place that does not tolerate sin, May we continue to share the good news. May we love our neighbors. May we be aware of their needs. And may we persevere until the day you return. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and watching this video with us. Of course, I would remind you that we're here in real life. Church takes place every Sunday at 9.30 and 11. Our 9.30 service has a traditional choir. We're gonna sing hymns. We're gonna do responsive readings. We're gonna take uh, the communion and say the Lord's Prayer. It's gonna feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. And then at 11 o'clock, it's more contemporary, more relaxed, come casual. We have a worship team and a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. On Wednesdays, we have youth group. Any sixth graders to 12th graders are welcome. Send your kid over on their bike, their skateboard. You can walk, have them walk over. We're close enough and we'll even feed them dinner for you. 
I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.